Here we are. Hello. Welcome. Oh, people pouring in, pouring in. How are you, Wesley? Oh, I'm very well. How are you, Leanne? Very good. Very good. Of, um, it, uh, here in Sydney, it's, it's got warm, a little bit warm. The sun's out and it's getting a bit warmer, which is very interesting. Um, great to see people kind of coming in. Thank you for joining us again. Many uh, familiar faces coming back in. It's been great, hasn't it, Leanne, having, you know, these chats on a Friday afternoon, gathering people together? Yeah, it consolidates my thoughts for the week. Oh, okay. You know, I just, yeah, I find it really consolidating and, you know, you sort of, you know, every week, every day gets busier and busier with, you know, different demands off Zoom and people and, um, yeah, I really find a way to sort of consolidate my week, pack it away and then go into the weekend. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel really quite rejuvenated from it too. I was just reading an article about what the Prime Minister has been saying about the three steps um, uh, and though they give no timeline, they say, when we get to the next step, this is what will happen. So at least to give some kind of indication. But um, step three still is only gatherings of 100 in public. So a little interesting. But it, it's wonderful to see that uh, step two, I think it was, funerals. No, step one, funerals uh, up to 30 people at least, which is um, a good thing. That, that, that first step being about friends and family coming together, about the human contact. So... That's, that's very good to hear a lot more of that. Um, but Wesley, I guess that, the, you know, the impact of that is that, you know, state borders are still closed. Yes. So even if family wanted to travel into state, um, you know, there's still a lot of restrictions around that. So, you know, we'll, we'll take each day as it comes. Well, and a good reminder, I think, Leanne, that everyone needs to look at what's uh, applicable in their state or territory or in their area because... There, there won't be a universal position across the nation in terms exactly. of, you know, what you can do where. You have to look at what's locally uh, available for you. And even though this is a national um, uh, gathering, uh, we might be saying things here but that are not applicable to a particular jurisdiction. So a big encouragement for everyone who's, who's getting on board to check on what's happening locally. I know Queensland, there's a lot more opening in Queensland than in New South Wales, say at the moment because of the way the virus is working. So good to keep checking that and um, how that all happens. I see Dan Mitchell come on board. Uh, Ellen Van Nieren, good to see you again, Ellen. It's always great to, to see regular faces coming back. Well, faces, names popping up on a screen. I guess that's that's faces for me. Uh, uh, Joanne Dreesen's there, good to see you. Wonderful to have you here. Lenora Thanka, uh, Lisa Mazza, what, come in to see your sister? What, you don't want to come any other time, but you want to come see your sister? Yeah, we know what it's like. We know. Um, Ellen's saying that she's looking forward to today, which is great. Leanne, how that's all working as well. Uh, oh. Jason Passfield saying, Yama to everyone. Good to have you back, Jason. Thank you so much for joining us. We've got about 37 people online and more joining all the time. Um, Leanne, how's it going in Adelaide for you? What's, um, what's coming up and happening for you there? Um, what's happening in Adelaide? Look, everything's busy and ticking along in Adelaide. Uh, I think that um, for me in particular, um, we've got something exciting happening at the end of the month, Wesley, oh, for the country. Well, it's it's um, May. And what does May tell us? Oh, year? yes, of course. Uh, we've got uh, the end of May is obviously the um, anniversary of the referendum, which we all know, but it also becomes the First Nations, the National First Nations Arts Awards, of which yep. the Red Ochre plays a big role. That's a fantastic thing. And we're going to do uh, a broadcast similar to this, which would be great. Uh, uh, remembering the, the Red Ochre is the Lifetime Achievement Award and we've got a male and a female one. There's the Dreaming Award and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Arts Fellowships. Uh, and this year, the award ceremony will be broadcast through a live stream between six and seven o'clock on the 27th of May. Uh, so there'll be a live performance by the Stiff Gins and I'll be doing a dance as well uh, in terms of my interpretive dance. Uh, this is an important opportunity to connect and to celebrate the work of First Nations artists across the country. That was a joke, people. I'm not <laughs> interpretive dance. I'll leave you were asking that. about duos before and I thought, what is it? Fred Astaire and... <laughs> oh, you're Ginger Rogers. Can I be Ginger Rogers? <laughs> I'll be Ginger Rogers. I can't wait. So Thank just, you. you know, as, as, as like we always do, Wesley and I will be co-hosting that event and um, very much look forward to it. And I'll miss the Sydney Opera House this year. 
I mean, Sydney well, Opera House is such a fantastic venue, and um, and and they're very good people uh, at the Sydney Opera House, and we've we've shared a very long um, association with with the awards with the Sydney Opera House. So. We have indeed. I mean, it'll look, it'll still be there next year. Here's something special, something new. So it's great. Talking about special and new, I see Zane Saunders popping in again. Um, he's special. Is he new? No, he's old. Not right? new, but he is special. <laughs> great to see you here, Zane. Uh, Stephanie Parkin, great to see you there, cousin. Uh, uh, Sophia Hall. From Cal. Yeah. It's oh, we're about weather all's online. Yes. Good to see you, supporting your partner. I see uh, Douglas Watkin. <laughs> Good to see you, Douglas. Thank you for joining us now. Lynn Chapman, uh, Ch Chapman, thank you very much for coming on board. Alec or Helen, you've been here like every time, Alec, I think. Great to have you here. We've just, it's just two past two now and we've got about uh, 70 people all up online and we're just waiting a little bit longer. Let some more people come in there, Leanne. But, you know, the sense of saying, yes, we're not at the Opera House for the First Nations Arts Awards this year, but in fact, you know, that's all right. It'll be there next year. Here's a special event, a special digital event. Um, we have um, Peter Kift, who's a, a virgin attendee, which is bragging a little bit. Um, but uh, great to have you here, Peter. Thank you so much for coming on board. Um, I'm sure you'll work on that condition over time. Uh, and Claire Cole, great to see you. Great to see all of us mob come in together um, and kind of coming here to share uh, some wisdom, support each other. Daniel Riley, great to have you here as well. Leanne. Craig Green from ANU's here. I always get a lovely text from Craig. Every every round table I get straight away wonderful text from Craig Green. Always good to see you here, Craig. You know people will be jealous now. They'll be sending you texts after this. They'll be going, oh, I'll <laughs> get a proper shout out when I send it. <laughs> uh, Nicole Chaffee, thank you so much for coming on board. We're just a couple more minutes. We're at the moment about 76 people online. What's What's interesting too, Lots of people joining in, uh, coming on and watching it and being part of the live experience. Um, but lots of people going back and looking at it again later, uh, going online, because all of this is being recorded and you can actually see not just this one, which is I think the eighth week we've been doing it, two months we've been doing these, these um, podcast broadcasts. And, um, oh, Michelle Jenkins is also another Virgin attendee uh, which is fantastic from Bunbury Regional Entertainment Agency. Great to have you here. Maybe the yes, birds well. will meet and and um, exchange notes on on how these things are working. But you can check out all of them, all eight of these, on the Australia Council website, as well as some great resources and things as well. We're coming up to four minutes past two. We've got about seventy five people online now. Um, we'll start in about a minute, everyone. Yep. And meanwhile, you can listen to our banter. Wesley, while, while we're bantering, <laughs> I think one of the things that I'd like to say to all of our attendees too, you know, if, if you uh, have any ideas about the round table, want to give us any feedback, we, we very much welcome that. Um, you know, we're always sort of looking at, um, you know, the, the breadth of, of who we can bring on to talk to the sector um, and share some of those ideas. But please... You know, the chat's there. Send through your ideas, any suggestions. You know, we'd, we're very much open to that. Well, fantastic. Uh, Leanne, it is now five past two. I think we've got a number of people in and people will continue to join us as we go. We've got 79 people online, uh, including all of the panellists and people uh, in the background there. So maybe we'll be ready to, to start. What do you think? I think we should get started. Let's do that. So we'll yes. move into the, um, the PowerPoint um, and we'll talk through, oh, we've jumped to the end of the PowerPoint. We'll jump to the beginning and we'll start the process. So just to start to say, hello, everyone. Welcome back. This is week eight of these uh, gatherings. I'm Wesley Enoch. Uh, I'm a Nunak or Nugi man from Minjidaba, Stradbroke Island, Kwandamuka country up there. And I'm also the, your co-host and the chair of the First Nations strategy panel for the Australia Council. And joining me, the wonderful and exuberant Leanne Buckskin, uh, all the way from Ghana country down there in, in Adelaide. Uh, Leanne is the deputy chair of the Australia Council and our co-host here 
And it's great to have so many people here joining us week on week, Leanne. Absolutely. Thank you, Wesley. Um, yes, I'm Leanne Juniper Buckskin, and um, thanks, uh, Wesley, for that. I'm a Narunga Wurrungal Wajabalik woman um, from South Australia, based in Adelaide, uh, lovely Adelaide, uh, and um, it's very good to be here uh, and seeing everyone, you know, our usual people who come back every week and um, all of our new guests joining us this week. We've got uh, t three guests joining us. Uh, you may already know, you've, you've got the emails there. We have uh, Rachel Mazza, AM, so she does things in the morning. Uh, she's the Artistic Director of Ilbidri. We have Eva Grace uh, Mullaly, who's the Artistic Director of Yuri Yarkin Theatre in Perth and Marinda Donnelly, who's the executive producer of Black Dance, and they'll be talking to us today about the idea of uh, industry and how industry is coping, and this idea of getting us you know, back into it, I guess, as well. Um, Leanne, I might pass on to you to talk a little bit, uh, just to acknowledge country for us. Thanks, Wesley. Um, well, I'll begin by uh, acknowledging that uh, I meet on Ghana land here on the Adelaide Plains, and I acknowledge uh, elders uh, present, uh, both past and present, and also acknowledge the ancestors as well. But also everyone out there on country, you know, I, I acknowledge all of the beautiful nations that you uh, reside on today and meet on today. Thanks, Wesley. As we were saying, this is the eighth of these First Nations roundtables, and today we're focusing on industry on stage and how we're dealing with the impact of COVID-19 and what strategies are in place to support the sector. We're very much, as we move to the next slide, talking about these values of connecting, of sharing, uh, have sharing ideas, networks, and navigating our way through. And the agenda, just to give you a, a, a point there as well, of the agenda is looking at housekeeping, just tell you how to navigate the site, especially for all the virgins amongst us. Uh, and also look at some of the uh, key issues and questions arising from last week's webinar. As I said, those three amazing guests uh, that will take us through from morning to evening. And then also a panel discussion. We'll talk a little bit about some of the ideas that have come through. We've got some resources to share uh, in terms of some websites and some connections. Uh, and also remembering that all of this is on the Australia Council website, a little bit of grants update and what we're going to do collectively, how we're going to go uh, together, what ideas we might have to share and a little bit of a round table discussion about well, what we're looking at for the next round table next week. We are planning to go through to, I think, the end of June, aren't we, Leanne? Yes. Keep these discussions going. So as Leanne was saying, if there's anything you want to share, anything you want to hear from, uh, someone you want to he hear from or ideas you want to discuss, please send through those ideas. It's going to be very, very important. Uh, and we'll do a little pulse check and check on everyone else around the place as well. If we go to the next slide, we'll talk quickly about some housekeeping. Just navigating the, the, the site here for those especially coming for the first time. If you take your cursor and you go down to the bottom of the window, you'll see participants. You can tap on that and it'll open up and you'll, you'll be able to see the names in alphabetical order of who's there. There's also a Q&A button. If you hit on that, you can just put in a specific question. Leanne and I will be monitoring that, that uh, box so that if you have any questions in there that we can try to either ask one of the panelists or answer ourselves, or even we might just, you know, throw, type in a little answer as well. There's people in the, in the back room there who's able to, able to answer those questions. Uh, then we have a chat box. Um, many of you have already found that. I see Ree and Zane, uh, Marinda's in there already. Gabrielle is, is from Cubby Cubby Country talking. You can open that little chat box and see what's going on and get keep up to date. You can also just, you know, send little messages to each other uh, so you can talk back and forward there uh, along the way. And if you need to, there's a, something called closed caption. If for whatever reason uh, the audio isn't sufficient for you or you are hearing impaired, you can in fact open up the closed captioning and you can read what we're saying, even if I do speak very fast. I think they capture everything eventually even if I do talk like I don't even draw breath, Leanne. Apparently that's, <laughs> I'm getting a lot of feedback, feedback on my beard and the fact that when do I actually breathe? And people have been saying I breathe through different orifices at times and how do I, how do, I do that? <laughs> um, so please feel free to use the Q&A box to throw in some questions of the panellists. 
um, <laughs> Claire Coleman saying, Wesley, you don't need to. Don't. <laughs> That's right. I just, uh, I just survived the way I am. Uh, and just a reminder for those people who are joining us, there's now 92 of us online, just to say that if you do wish to, you can uh, go back and look at the other uh, webinars we've had. You can listen to them all and look at some of the resources that will be online. Uh, we might go to the next slide, Leanne, and just talk about how last week's um, webinar yeah. went. Sure. So last week, Wesley, uh, and, and those who joined us last week would remember that we had uh, three wonderful guest speakers, uh, since the Mansell, uh, Wooken Wannabe uh, from up there in Yurikala, and also to John Harvey, uh, talking about the film sector. Um, since, uh, has a dance group in Tasmania, um, Pakana uh, Kanapila, and I hope if uh, she's here that I've uh, pronounced that correctly. So um, basically, since I shared um, what some of her small daily ceremonies are um, and a way in which she stays connected to her creative development and opportunities, um, <clears throat> she raised the question of how we can best utilise technology uh, and I think that, you know, very honestly, since the share that, um, you know, the digital space is something that she's cautious of, I guess, um, and probably would need give, to give a lot more thought. She doesn't see herself in that digital space. But then, you know, again, how do you um, move forward in a time like this where perhaps digital and what we're looking at is digital technology really being part of the tool set um, of connecting with audiences? Um, Wook and Wannabe is from Yurikala and he works for the Mulka Project. Um, he shared his work in terms of 3D and VR technologies and the way in which he uses those, uh, those technologies to create the most stunning artwork um, and very much steeped in cultural, uh, from culture uh, is his uh, sculpture pieces but also the way in which he brings about that technology by sharing cultural stories. Um, and he, you know, he said that one of the important things that he stressed was that the use of technology doesn't weaken his connection to culture, rather that it allows him to explore different um, ways of looking at sharing it, uh, sharing culture with audiences. Uh, John Harvey, um, who we we know is uh, from Brown Cab uh, Productions as well. He's been in the theatre sector. He's been um, a producer in the film industry and director. So uh, his most recent work was Spear. Beautiful uh, work with uh, Stephen Page. Uh, he spoke about the importance of adapting the creative process of um, process to the individual storyteller rather than adapting the voice to the process. Uh, John also spoke about using technology as, as a simple tool rather than allowing us to adapt to the tools. Storytelling must always stay central to the pro uh, process. So that was last week in a snapshot, Wesley. There was a lot of amazing... It was interesting, wasn't it, that since they're talking about, I don't want to engage in the digital oh. technologies because I want to keep culture alive in the people in many ways. And uh, Wookan going, actually, I don't feel threatened at all by the digital technologies. In fact, it strengthens. So lots of different opinions there. And ultimately, I know some of the chat talking about access, access to these digital technologies is one of the strong um, issues that we're seeing over and over again, which communities have access to digital technologies, how they're accessing that in terms of skills, but also hardware, where are you kind of building up this body of work. It's fascinating. And, and hopefully our next three speakers will be able to give us some more insight into what they're doing in that particular area as well. We might go to the next slide, please, Michelle. Um, so we've got our three speakers. We've got Rachel Mazza, who, as I, I joked, got uh, an Order of Australia this year for the recognition for her work. And when I was talking to her, I'm going, go, what does that mean? What does that mean? She talked also about the strength uh, of recognition that meant when her father also got an Order of Australia um, many years ago now, but and that sense of what pride that means for the recognition of us all. And that's a really wonderful thing. And she'll be talking a little bit about her work at Ilvidri Theatre. Um, Eva Grace Mullaly, uh, 
Malayali. She told me I have to say the ale in the middle, so <laughs> I have to make sure Malayali. Uh, please excuse me, Eva Grace. Um, talking about Yuri Yarkin and some of the amazing work they're doing on Hecate, which was one of their great shows at the last Perth Festival, uh, which also uh, Black Ties, a literary show was there as well, a fantastic experience. And Marinda Donnelly, who's the you know, fearless executive director of Black Dance. I mean, God, how do you hold it together, Marinda, and still have two children under the age of what, four? They're under four? Goodness gracious me. Anyway, we'll hear from more of these extraordinary women, but we we'll, might start with the lovely Rachel Mazza, who I think has become, you know, a sign of wisdom and strength in our theatre community in particular. Um, Rachel, thank you for joining us. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and, and uh, what's going on in your world? Absolutely. Um... Can we, can, uh, am I hear, being heard all right? Is this yes, okay? you're being heard. You're very clear. Awesome. 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 Oh, technology out in the bush, I tell you. Um, so, yeah, Rachel Mazar, Yidinji Mary, I'm woman. I'm actually currently living, um, I'm very lucky to be living on Tunnerong Country, which is basically two, three hours north of Melbourne. Um, it's 12 years. I've just reached the 12 year anniversary, or well, past that now, but of working at Ilbidgeri as artistic director. And, um, yeah, so the company has been um, bunkering down like everybody else. Uh, it's been quite profound, I have to say, the, these platforms like Zoom and the connectedness that's been made possible because of this technology. And obviously there's pros and cons, but the, you, you're not getting the face-to-face -face and that way, that same way that uh, you're able to build you know, engage with someone only that can happen by being sitting with someone. But yet there's definitely an access that's been um, created because you can sit there and still read their faces. Um, so uh, I'm able to switch from meetings and have uh, meetings with people from great distances, which normally I wouldn't have been able to do. So a lot of possibilities have opened up um, working with this technology in a way that we wouldn't have done beforehand. But anyway, so acknowledging um, country that I'm on, um, uh, I just wanted to start by doing a quick snapshot of the company and then actually talk on some more bigger, bigger thinking that's been made possible because of this kind of uh, enforced self-isolation that we're all on. Um, so I'll go to the... Uh, so Ilbidgeri, basically, is, for those of you who don't know Ilbidgeri, um, is based in Melbourne, it's going to be turning 30 next year. It was born out of community and created as a platform um, in the absence of to be able to tell our stories as Aboriginal people of this land, Torres Strait Islander people, um, where are the places for our stories? But more than that, to be able to creatively be in control of those stories in a truly self-determined way. So Ubidjuri was born out of that need. Um, and I still uh, keep to my in, my, in the core of my, um, heart for the company is that same spirit of which the company was born. Um, so we work across multiple platforms. If I can just jump to the first slide. So this, as um, as uh, as as uh, Wesley mentioned, our just recently touring production Black Ties, which was a co-production with Tarahia Theatre based in Auckland, um, and was a phenomenal journey between our two companies. The coming together of um of two first nations theater companies truly self-determined full uh first nation creative team um it was certainly the biggest scale work that we've done um but it was was uh, quite an extraordinary um challenging at times but amazing journey um and and uh, you know in a really kind of um uh, probably not so ideal uh, way. It was definitely around the, the the impetus to create a work of this scale definitely came out of a, yeah, why not? Why shouldn't we be making works of this scale? Um, so I was really happy to take that challenge on and, uh, and fortunately we got there, it worked. <laughs> um, we've got a whole raft of, a whole raft of the work that we're doing is creative development. So a whole lot of new works that are in the pipeline. Um, I don't have slides for them, but um, Tracker, Daniel Riley, who's, who's part of the crowd here tonight, today, um, his story of his great uncle, Alec Riley, the Tracker, um, dance text piece, 
uh, big name, no blanket, a work by um, Anupa Butcher, who was um, previously work, working with and currently in, tentatively working with Ilbidjuri, but now based back on country up in Alice Springs and Papanya. But the story of the Warampi band, so big scale music, um, uh, you know, text, story, drama, but, um, the works, that a little, that, that another exciting project. Um, the biggest, the big, big project, which is specifically to the country that Ilbidjuri is based on, is the Bunurung story. The, the legacy of the generations of warrior women who, who have come from Louisa Briggs, right down to Nawit Carolyn Briggs, and then her daughter, um, Caroline Martin, or Briggs Martin. Um, so another uh, incredible uh, project to be having the privilege of, of um, uh, developing. As well as the major works, I'm sure I've left something out there, but as, as well as the major works, we have our education and health works, and that's the works where, um, we can go to the next slide, where we're actually, the idea is we're developing works very much targeted to our mob. So working with organisations uh, in, in where we can reach those, those uh, members of our community. Um, so there's a whole body of work and some brilliant partnerships that we've had with various organisations like the Department of Health and Human Services and uh, VATSHO and the health organisations, um, Hepatitis Victoria, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the picture that you're looking at now is a production uh, that we toured um, last year and uh, is still ready for touring. A beautiful piece called Scar Trees as, as an example of this body of works. But there's basically been, uh, we're, we're developing our sixth production in over the last 15 years um, and beginning with the uh, original production Shop Liver. But yeah, a whole raft of um, extraordinary works, beautiful three-hander developed with VACA addressing issues around family violence. Um, so those are the works that, as you can see, very small production values and it, go, it goes everywhere. Those, these works are the ones where we take the work to the, to the community, uh, and often to people who have never seen, um, you know, theatre before. Our next image is uh, we do a whole lot of work around artist development. Um, and we, we've got several initiatives there. One is Black Rights, which is about developing writers and new works. It's a series of commissions as well as creative master labs uh, over a 12 month period. Um, also, the image that you're looking at now is last year's ensemble. So we're now going into our second year of the ensemble. Um, last year they did a production that the image you're seeing there now is it was at Fairfax um, for the um, uh, Beyond, uh, oh my gosh, I've got the name of the festival, the youth festival, the annual, uh, what do you call it, inaugural festival at Art Centre. Um, future, oh, beyond future. Oh my God, something like that. Oh my God, sorry if you're listening. <laughs> um, uh, so that was, and that was a brilliant opportunity for these young fellas to learn craft, to have a go, but also to have this full production values around them. It was an amazing production of Richard Franklin's Conversations with the Dead. And it was an opportunity for a highly um, accomplished actor, Sharina Clanton, to be able to step up as director. So once again, opportunities for our mob to step up. Um, so um, all these initiatives um, in that regard are, are super, super at the core and heart of our work, which is growing Rachel, this next generation. Rachel, I'm hearing that it's called yes. Future Echoes was the name of that. Ah, oh, Future Echoes, thank you. you. Oh, thank, thank you for helping me out there. Thanks, mate. <laughs> um, and also we're, we're gonna be building in to our projects coming up in the future this is all reliant on um or has been dependent on the capacity to do that and my fellow companies that will be speaking after me you know we share this um how do you create more opportunities so we're going to be embedding in some in our projects coming up um uh, uh crab and the mangrove tree oh my goodness sorry and bargook uh positions for aspiring any of you mob out there, aspiring set designers, lighting designers, whatever creative sound designers, um, positions that paid positions on the project, learning on the job and being mentored, either co-working with or being mentored by or where, whatever the, the, you know, the, the right fit is, um, opportunities for people to learn on the job. So really keen to um, um, get some, reach out, don't hesitate to reach out, please. Uh, we also do work, next slide, in sector development. Um, so 
and as you can hear, a lot of the, the majority of our work, aside from our core business, which is making theatre, is about growing this next generation. So here, the yeah, Daniel, Daniel Riley there. Um, we have two executive mentored associate producers. So aside from that, there are another four producers. So we have an office basically full of uh, um, uh, kick-ass, um, I think there's a couple online here now, um, producers in, in our office, all learning on the job, being mentored on the job, um, you know, and, and all of you out there that work in theatre, these there are big gaps and one of the big gaps is, um, yeah, where, where, our, where our leaders in the arts. Um, okay, so that's a kind of snapshot of the company and that took most of my 10 minutes. Oh, my God, this is not good. Because what I did want to get to talking about actually was um, just acknowledging the incredible resilience of our sector. And when I thought about it, I thought I'm not surprised, given if there's anyone in this, in this country who has, um, who's got used to living on two minute noodles and knows how to survive, you know, it's a tough industry. So I really acknowledge the resilience and tenacity and optimism of our sector. And I, I'm very inspired by what I'm seeing going on and the conversations that are going on and also the capacity of community to really pull together and look after our own. So I've been hearing, bringing up a couple of elders and getting stories of, you know, the people have been dropping off food packs for them and I just, ah, it makes my heart so warm. So I'm, I'm so, you know, acknowledging the, the extraordinary tenacity and resilience of our sector. Um, but I, what I, the other point that I wanted to touch on, and please, Wesley, just shout, shout me down when I've talked too much, is the opportunity that we, I've had personally um, and within the company to really think about some of the bigger, bigger conversations that we just never get round to, or they, they're kind of constantly coming up, but then they end up on the back burner because of the kind of business of you know, delivering the next production or whatever it is. So um, they, they, I just think what an extraordinary time it's been. And the comment I'm hearing from everyone is the time to stop, to think and reflect, to heal, to uh, spend time with family, to spend time on country, um, to really ask some big questions yourself about the direction that you're going with your life or, or ideas for projects or, or why are you working on certain projects? Uh, etc. So I think that's, I think we have to um, really acknowledge what an extraordinary time this is. This, this horrendous thing has created this opportunity for thinking. Um, and I just think this is a, a really healthy thing. For instance, one of the big things that Ilbidjuri has been, uh, been thinking about within the company is wanting to address the massive gaps that exist around ICIP for theatre, for black contemporary theatre. There's an incredible body of work um, that Terry Jenke has been leading and led and done with the Australia Council in regards Great, to... Can you um, tell us what ICIP means, just to... to uh, it yes, yes, intellectual, um, intellectual, cultural... Hey, shut up. Indigenous cultural and intellectual property. Hey! Oh, my that, God, did I get those words in the wrong order? Something no, like right. that. Uh, intellectual, cu cultural, copyright. Anyway... You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and uh, there's a really big body of work that, that is needing to be done and it's such an issue. For instance, if I'm working with a, a community member who we're going to tell her story and uh, she has no experience writing, so we bring in a writer to work alongside her. Now, the current system is, um, according to the Australian Writers Guild and the laws that be, the writer is the person who, and this is historically how it has always rolled in, this, in, in the history of the telling of the stories of this country, is that the writer who holds the pen or the keyboard or whatever it is that walks away with full ownership and copyright of that work unless it's negotiated otherwise. So there's a default, a default that goes to the person who holds the pen, which is often in our case, our mob are orators and they speak the story. So, for instance, in this fictitious scenario, one auntie there, she sits down, she orates, orates the story to the person who's going to write it down and she's so excited because her story is going to get told and she's got a story that deserves to be told and should be told and it's going to blow people's minds when they hear it. So she knows it's an important story that needs to be told. She sits down with that writer, that writer types away, whatever, um, cuts and pastes it and shape, shapes it a bit. That writer 
if she's not on on her not you know not on top of it that writer walks away with full 100% copyright of her story and that's how it's always worked so at Ilbidgery obviously we're self determined it's all about maintaining ownership the principle about all our work that we make is that the story is is the person whose story it is has creative and cultural control over how that story is shaped and that they remain the owner of that story going forward into the future so that they are empowered in that process and that all too often doesn't happen particularly if people are working with non-indigenous organizations so as a black color organization yeah, it's fascinating hey, even in the visual arts world you know if you have uh let's say you go to a, a, a sacred site where there's rock paintings you take the photo of it you own the copyright because you're the one who took the photo and so, so there's oh, very weird issues around how copyright works and therefore i think the moral rights conversation is a is a very interesting one um john harding mm. right here about leah purcell uh it was the writer, it was Scott Rankin, had the uh, ICIP issue with Box the Pony, which was interesting. That's it. Um, I think, you know, even yeah. Stolen was an interesting kind of case in point two, where it came from, from stories gathered. Who owns it at the end is a very interesting thing. Um, exactly. Uh, and it's, it's actually not a black-white issue here. No. no like, no, it's no. actually just about how do we do it? Like, how do we make sure we, we still honour that writer and the craft that they bring and all that stuff, but you cannot honour that at the expense of honouring who holds the story. And because the story, as blackfellas, we're just the tip of that iceberg. There's that whole mountain of 80,000, I'm making up numbers now, but, you know, our, our culture that goes back since the beginning of time. You, come, you bring that into the room every time you work on something. So at the moment, we have a system that has an inbuilt, inherent bias towards the written word over the orated word, yes. which you can instantly see disadvantages us as, a, as, as an oral speaking culture. And there's a question here from Val McGrath who's saying, how do you go with a painting then? If you sell a painting, can you maintain the copyright so that it's not reproduced? That's right. You, you, you own that through... Absolutely. Yeah, right. absolutely. And the difference between copyright and moral rights is something that um, actually Terry Jenkins written some amazing things on that. So it's it's worth kind of having mm. a look at that as well. Um, Rachel, this whole idea yeah. of the time out and taking the time to think about things. I've heard someone call it the great pause. This moment where the pause button is hit and you go, okay, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, when I eat dogs with pause. No, this sense of it is an active time. What's your thinking about what should we be doing in this time? I think it's absolutely an opportunity for people. Oh, thanks, Ari. That just got me coffee delivered. Um, it's absolutely a time for uh, an opportunity, I should say, for us to really sit and reflect and recharge. I just also realise how burnt out we all are. The industry is a tough industry and we do it because we love it. No one's doing it for the money and we're certainly not doing it for the, the opportunity to put your feet up and enjoy the good life like it's a tough gig but we do it because we're passionate and and because it's important and and we're mad obviously but uh, <laughs> but there's an a time to really uh, heal as well you know um i'm feeling myself getting fully recharged and i don't know if i've felt this good for a long time actually so yeah the, the opportunity to recharge re heal but but mostly just reflect i'd encourage everyone to get um, do all those little exercises too where you get that bit of, um, here we go, written word bias, okay, or a recorder. Get your paper, your pad beside your book, um, beside your bed, I should say, and a pen or a recorder for the, for the, oral, <laughs> the oral speakers and actually just start getting your juices flowing. Right, 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 right. Play, 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 sing, you know, talk, speak it out, whatever it is. Like start really using this opportunity to get your create, creative juices flowing as well. I am super excited to see the work that's going to come out of this this era, this chapter. Rachel, thank Rachel you so can much. I? Sorry, just sorry, Wesley. Can I just step in there, just in sure. terms of um, Elbidgery's work and the whole digital space? Mm. In terms of you know we're we're looking at recovery now, um, and that's what government's talking about. So. You know, how do you see obituary coming out of the next 18 months? 
Um, and, and what is it that Elvidgery is doing in terms of reaching audiences currently? Have you transferred no, things online? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm probably one of the old school that has really struggled with this idea of jumping to the digital platform. I'm a bit like um, um, Sensor from last week. You know, it was just like, oh, yeah, I'm, I don't. I, for me, theatre is all about the, the living in the moment experience that you have by being in the same room. And I just converting that into the digital platform is really problematic. That said, on the other hand, um, we have been running our ensemble going into second year and that's all happening on the digital platform. And that's working a goddamn treat. It actually has made it really accessible for these young fellas. Um, yeah. There's, in fact, we've, we're able to include people from the regions or from Tasmania. Like, so suddenly it's actually expanded our reach and our possibility. It's shifted the focus. It's become less about rolling around in the room together and more about generating ideas, which is kind of perfect because last year they did a, an established script. This year, the idea is that they're devising their own script. Oh, by the way, all of you mob, get on to Illidri, um, who want to join the ensemble. We're still open. It runs every Saturday. <laughs> oh, and the other thing I wanted to say, actually, before... Um, I, Sorry, before uh, I take moved on. Yes, keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before I break that, uh, that big hook come. Um, yeah. yeah, also on, online, we've just opened up a um, quick response boost for artists affected by COVID. Um, quick response grant. Um, very simple application process. So, um, I mean, the focus is prioritising Victorian. So, all you Victorian fellas out there got a project or a, pro a professional development opportunity um get online and put your application in we basically it's open until the money runs out so so get and in I know there. That there are a number of things around you know there's thousand uh, dollar gap grants as well if you if you're feeling mm -hmm. like that that you need something even outside of the performing arts you can actually talk to uh nava there's a visual arts um assistance program there called the artist benevolent fund if you want to get things there's a few things coming through in the chat that i just might point out there's uh, a couple of um info sheet uh, people referencing inf info sheets. If you can put some links in, that would be great. Um, that's Michael West. Just have a look at it. the arts law um, things to go through there. A couple of conversation starters going, what is it about we should maybe go back to some of the older ways of being as well, some older plays, especially referencing Gary Foley and Uncle Jack uh, that work happening at like Ninda Thana and Black Theatre, Redfern. There's a, a, a few references mm. there to what are the old um, stories, the oral stories, uh, that we can look at and this idea too that for some people this isn't a time out it's really busy um, some people saying too that they're not getting the time out and the relax that it's really kind of go 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 all the zoom calls everyone being absolutely wrecked by just go 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 all the time a uh, number of people saying here um, Rachel that you're just deadly and that you've got Ari <laughs> well obviously Ari's well trained to deliver coffee <laughs> so that's a good thing. Um, and <laughs> say, uh, John Harding saying, you know, old, old people's plays. What about Up the Road? You know, he's an old person. Old oh, person. yeah. Well, Up the Road is, is uh, I think it's going to be its 30th anniversary as well. So, yeah, mm -hmm. definitely need a remount of Up the Road. He's saying here, Il Vidri's first production was Up the Road and, uh, and John That's Harding it. being the, the writer there. Daniel uh, Riley has put up the link there for the Blackfella Boost Quick Response Grants for Il Vidri. Get on, check, check in the, the chat line and get there. We might move on then. We've got um, uh, Eva Grace Mullaly, who's going to take us through and talk a little bit about uh, the work she's doing in Noongar Buja. Uh, the Yuri Yaka, their fantastic Noongar Theatre Company. Over to you, Eva Grace. Hiya, Wesley. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm Eva Grace Mullaly. I am based on Wajak Noongar Buja in Perth, Western Australia. Um, I'm a wedding Yaralu from the Yamaji Nation in the Midwest of Western Australia and I relocated back here for this amazing job uh, just over a year ago. So <laughs> it's, been, it's been a great first year in the job. Um, <laughs> um, uh, next slide please. So I want to talk about the projects that we had already going and what we've done with them. Um, we're in a really blessed position to uh, not, we haven't had to cancel anything. We had a great Hecate at the start of the year, had our great show. Um, be part of Perth Festival and was untouched by the COVID-19 situation, which is fantastic. Uh, our next production was going to be a presentation from Canada. Um, we haven't 
cancelled that. We've just cancelled the time frame and we're looking at um, possibly, hopefully, programming it in next year's program. Um, our Metro Riders Group, which has going, been going for a long time, uh, an annual riders group, we, our facilitators weren't comfortable at looking at uh, Zoom workshops for that, but they've taken it all to an email and uh, dramaturgy platform where they're responding to all the riders, so they're all going good guns and having a great time. We piloted our regional riders group this year in Geraldton, um, which I'm so super excited about and was kind of devastated to have to postpone, but we pushed that through to term three in the year. And, you know, fingers crossed that by then we're able to get back to business semi-normal. Um, Nalakada is our new youth ensemble that we're partnering with Waco for, the West Australian Youth Theatre Company. Um, they're just so good at doing ensembles, so we wanted to work with them to uh, bump up the skills of our general ensemble group. And it's we've got 34 participants this year. And they're doing online language lessons to begin with and then when we can come back into a room they're going to get into the physical and the acting and the rest. Um, Billy Cuttigan is our incursion uh, schools show this year and it was scheduled to be in terms two and three. We pushed it through to terms three and four and then as time went on we thought maybe um, it's best to have it in just in term four this year and then we're going to remount it again next year so it's going to get its life that it needs. And we're really excited about that one. It's the final in our Cutagen series, which there's been five of, I'm pretty sure. Um, and then we're looking at new ways of making kids theatre, which is super exciting. I like anything new. I like a challenge um, and I like change. So it works for me. <laughs> um, Murich Werla is our workshop series that was also scheduled to go into high schools in second and third term. Uh, we pushed that to third and fourth and it's um, amazing creative director, Zach James, is running these forum theatre workshops talking about um, uh, issues and culture affecting and influencing teenagers. So, yeah, we're really, I'm really excited that that's still going ahead. Am I back? Um, what else? We, I mean, we did have to cancel our Yuriak annual picnic, which was a bit devastating. That was in March that we well, wasn't in March, and um, was also our launch uh, of our season. So kind of okay that it didn't go ahead because our season hasn't done, you know, has changed a lot. Um, what else? Our NADOC week contributions were Yuri Yarns, which come from our writers groups. Uh, that's the picture that you can see on the slide is uh, a readings of 10 minute excerpts from everything our writers have done in our writers groups. And it's always a fantastic night we were looking at splitting it into two nights none of this i'm just really happy and blessed to say none of this has been cancelled it's all been postponed and we we worked really fast our entire team worked really fast to push and um jig everything into where it needed to be uh the only other one that uh is not going on this year is the, our independent support so we support an independent show to go into the blue room every year usually around NADOC week, um, they postponed, then they cancelled and they're looking at doing it next year. So it's something we support from the outside, not something that we actually make happen. So yeah, really, yeah, really, really proud to say that we're in a, a brilliant position where we, can't, we, we haven't cancelled anything. We've just postponed or put into the back of our minds until we can fit it into things. Uh, next slide, please. Eva, Grace, just to ask a question there about yeah. Um, what, where have you postponed it to? Have you, have you got in your head uh, when you might move things? Yeah, so essentially um, November, December, January is our planning period and or we're rehearsing for a festival contribution or something. Um, so it, we slow down a little bit around that time. We don't have a whole lot of our community engagement and schools, things happening at that point. So we've got the space then to push the things mid-year to those areas yeah it just takes away from our planning time but we're doing that now so we've just kind of swapped when we're doing things yeah which is working quite well for us fantastic yeah. um okay so the first thing we did uh, i sat down with my producer and pretty much the whole team in at your and we're a team of 10 really amazing people um we sat down and kind of thought how do we support as a, as a company that's not really 
um, at risk of losing a lot of our revenue, how do we support our independent artists that are losing over six months worth of work and, um, and also being forced to stay at home and not collaborate and create that, that was my, my worry. Um, so we thought, all right, there's definitely a scope for us to find the ways to help people in developing their skills um, and to work on creating new works or, or things. So we put out an EOI, an expression of interest call to anyone that had something burning inside them that they needed to get out, that they wanted to work with us on or um, how we could support them to do that in any way. It was a real, a really blanket kind of call out. We no, we had no preconceived notion of what that would be. We just wanted to know where everyone was at and how we could help. Um, we got quite a few EOIs back and pretty much rolled with all of them. There's not, there was one or two that didn't quite fit. I couldn't see how we could help. It was just um, people wanting, that have been wanting to work with Yuri for a long time. And so we said, well, look, we'll talk to you later and let us support these artists now. Um, we picked up, so our amazing writer of Cracked that was on last year, at the start of last year, Barbara Hostelek, put forward three pages of ideas. She's amazing, I love that woman. <laughs> and the most exciting for me was she wants to turn Cracked into a graphic novel. And I just jumped at the idea because I can see how that can also support a lot of other artists such as Ruben Yorkshire, who's a graphic artist and, a, and an actor and a, and in everything, and we definitely all wear many, many hats. So it was, how can, how can we, the more artists we can support with each project, the better, pretty much. So we've encouraged the, those two to get together and have a talk about whether that works for them, whether that'll go ahead, and we're in the process of supporting that to come to fruition at some point. Um, we also picked up, uh, Nadia Martic put forward an amazing program for a dance theater piece uh, around, Blackfella ghost stories, you know, the stories we're told around the campfire by our mob, by our aunties and uncles. And um, when we all catch up those, those stories that, you know, scare the shit out of you, <laughs> but they work. The, mor the morality of them and the idea of them, um, not uh, my stories, for instance, were the ones you don't be greedy or you don't stray too far away. And, you, and those stories that my daughter still references when the jitty jitty's around or something like that, she'll let me know that, um, those spirits are there and watching and making sure that she's being okay. And I was really excited about Nadia's idea. She's a, um, oh, it's just gone out of my head. She's not from WA anyway. And so the idea of her working with her stories and her elders and collaborating with a, one or two Noongar artists and or West Australian artists from the breadth of Western Australia to bring those stories to life in a, in a tent so she wants a tent, which I think is amazing, and 10 people in a tent, and the story's being told outside. So it's shadow play and, and that kind of stuff. It's really, really exciting on what we could do for that. I, I really love and encourage new premise theatre, just the idea of thinking of doing it differently. Um, Shelley A. Gates is another one of the people on the hill. She's one of our, she was one of our writers group last year and again this year, and she wants to, to write a full length piece her first full length piece. And I wanted, I jumped at that idea because she wants to engage with a number of elders and pay them appropriately and work with them appropriately and look at that um, cultural and intellectual property uh, fr frame and make it work for her and us as well. So it was another case of, there's a lot of people that are actually involved in this. So we're supporting a lot of people and that, that was exciting. Yeah, next slide please. So then we thought about how do we support people's mental health and their creative well-being as well. I mean, I know as an artist, if I don't get to create something, I go insane and I start baking and me baking is not a good thing for anyone. So, <laughs> so I, part of that EOI process was also suggesting um, clubs and groups and how, ways for us to upskill our artists and the rest. And the first one I put in was a, I asked a group of, I think I asked about 15 people and 10 people came to the table on whether they wanted to learn Auslan. Because I noticed with um, Cracked and Iceland and Hecate, we there's no Noongar land. There's no one doing Auslan for our, for First Nations um, hearing, hard of hearing people. And 
we get we get an Auslan interpreter in whenever we can, but we can't when a show is completely in Noongar. And they can't interpret, interpret, well, bad wording, they can't interpret when our shows are in language. So in, even Skerricks. So the more blackfellas I can get learning Auslan that can then, if, if they're passionate about it, um, become interpreters in the long run, the better for us and the better for the sector. So there's 10 of us actively learning Auslan at the moment. I'm in, I'm in that as well. I think it's really, it's been wonderful, actually. We went through the alphabet and numbers and stuff in our first meeting the other day. It was great. Um, the Year of Play Club is, we want 15 to 20 participants. So we're going to start local. And by local, I mean all of WA to the state. But start relatively local um, with this Year of Play Club and the idea of paying an artist to facilitate one session. So our artists that are particularly struggling and wanting to upskill, but not sure what they can put forward artistically, they don't have a specific project that they want to work on at the time, can come into the Euro Play Club and get paid to facilitate one week's worth of a play reading. So they suggest the play, um, we pay them to then pick, uh, cast it out over Zoom, and we read it, and then we discuss it, and they've been paid for, to facilitate that workshop. And then the next week it's someone else. So there's 15 to 20 people that we can help support in that respect while learning. There's a lot of plays I haven't read. There's a lot of plays a lot of us haven't read. And so I kind of wanted to push that uh, idea of us continuing to engage with each other. Um, the What Now First Nations Virtual Poetry Workshops. So one of the EOA, uh, EOIs that we got was from Jennifer Compton in Melbourne. She's a great friend of mine, an amazing um, poet and playwright. And she put forward this gorgeous play but I reminded her that she's an, an astounding, uh, kind of globally renowned poet. And we have this poetry ensemble that we started last year that we wanted to re-engage with. So I said, why don't you show me what a workshop, a poetry workshop would look like in a series of four or five and uh, let's engage while we've got Zoom and while we're, while we're national and international over virtually. So why don't we roll with that? And she's put forward the, an amazing series and, yeah, we're, we're marketing that now to get more of our poets in. I, I kind of noticed when I first got back to Perth that there is, the poetry scene here is very niche and um, and kind of inaccessible to the mob a lot. Our First Nations poets here in Perth in particular are going it alone. And I thought, I, I'd love for us to ensemble up. I'd love for us to grab, grab some strength from each other and learn how to perform our poetry as well, because most of us write it. Write it. We just don't perform it. And then the last thing in that series is our honouring our elders. And it's a really basic kind of suggestion on how do we keep in touch with our elders? Um, how does everyone keep in touch with elders, even if we're not related to them? Um, myself being a, a Yamaji woman on Noongar country, I'm not related to most of the elders here, but I care very deeply about them. And so um, the honouring our elders series is just a bit of a touch, like a check-in with our elders, asking how they're going, asking for their permission to put their responses on Facebook or Instagram and, and a headshot and we put them on there, just making the world and uh, Perth aware of who our elders are here in, in Noongar Boja. Yeah. I mean, even Grace, I mean, goodness gracious. I mean, there's so much going on. Uh, yeah. What's lovely hearing <laughs> just in terms of Yuri Yark and, and, and Il Bidri, so much going on. Obviously, we can find out all of this on the website as well. There's a lot of detail about these projects on the website. What I've been fascinated by is this notion, too, that an arts company um, is not just about arts. It's about community. It's about engaging in a much broader kind of conversation. I mean, just you're talking then about elders, about young people, talking about language, about Auslan, those who, who mm. need Auslan interpreters. Uh, the, the notion too of language development, I mean, uh, just heck it, if not the sonnets, the Shakespeare program that you've been doing, poetry as a whole. It's really about um, Yuri Yarkin, in this case, being a hub for a whole range of activity. And maybe yeah. there's something to be said about this. I know even at the Australia Council, we talk about how these organisations, these arts organisations are really community development organisations as well. What's your view on that? What's the role of an arts company in your community? Well, I mean, I constantly look back to why we exist and why we formed in the first place, Wesley, and, and, and it was to provide a platform and a voice for uh, Noongar and West Australian Indigenous artists. And that doesn't 
always lend itself specifically to theatre, but the beautiful thing about theatre is every art form can go into it. So, so us supporting artists on every, in every way makes all the sense in the world to me because we do have, like Rachel said, we do have these major holes in, in people that we, we have. We have zero Indigenous producers in Western Australia. We have no sound designers. We have no set designers. Um, so we have plenty of set designers and sound designers, but not Indigenous ones. So um, I kind of look at how I got into theatre and it was by putting my hand up for anything. So okay. I'm just saying, well, here's all these opportunities and seeing who wants to put their hand up to learn. Yeah. Mm. It, the, it's like uh, Ian Wilkes says, and, and this is, I love this, is that he doesn't distinguish dance to theatre to music to anything. It's, it's a cultural practice and they all go hand in hand. And I think of theatre like that, we're a theatre company, but we shouldn't have to always distinguish between what is, what is specifically dance, what is specifically theatre, what is specifically visual arts, what is specifically poetry. They all go hand in hand. And so we need to, to support our artists, we need to support all the art forms. I mean, there's some conversation in the chat there about um, academics who are working in this idea of language, uh, Aus Auslan interpretation of language as well. Um, the person who said that, it'd be great if, uh, I think it was Leanne, if you, if you do have a link, it'd be great to put that name up as well. I think people would be interested in that. Um, we are going to run out of time. We could talk forever about this work. And, uh, I know so I'm on final words? One final words, that'd be great. <laughs> so what I wanted, the, the kind of... Um, the discussion I wanted to have was around the notion of recovery and we're really being pushed into this recovery mode at the moment. And I was talking to Rinder and Rachel about it the other day and I don't think recovery is the right word. I think recovering and striving to get back to the normal, which was an unhealthy ecology and economy for us is just the worst thing we could possibly do right now. I think we personally need to look at our responsibility to respond to this situation we need to reimagine our future. We need to take away what we've learned from this and how we've grown from this instead of taking massive steps backwards to where we were struggling in the first place. And I just, I wanna reiterate that by agreeing with Sinsa in saying this is nothing new for us. So how do we move forward? How do we build? How do we take this opportunity? Yeah. Well, I, I totally agree. I think there's a sense of how we can build a new normal rather than return to a world where climate change was was there. Lots of people on the chat saying, yep, absolutely, totally agree, thinking that this is the way forward. Um, Eva Grace, we'll come back to you when we have a chat all together, but it's time to move on. Um, Leanne, if you want to introduce the uh, Marinda Donnelly, um, the Mar I just put a the in front of Marinda's name, the Marinda Donnelly. There we go. Hey, Oh, it's an honour to um, introduce Marinda. Marinda is the executive producer of Black Dance, our peak uh, dance uh, body here in Australia. So I'm going to hand it straight over to you, Marinda. They're up there in Brisbane. Thank you, Leanne. <laughs> Yama, everyone. Um, I'm a proud Wiradjuri woman born in Forbes, and I'm also honoured to be here today. Thank you for the invitation, Wesley and Leanne. I want to start by acknowledging country. I am presenting today from Turrbal and Yagara homelands where I live and work with my family and team at Black Dance, High Wara Bar. I pay my greatest respects to them and their elders, my elders and our Black Dance elders who broke new ground for us and are the reason that we're here today. I want to acknowledge our founder, Marilyn Miller, who started Black Dance in 2005. Eva and Rach, thank you for sharing incredible grassroots actions and a national call to arms for protocol implementation. Rach, we can't wait to work with you on this in dance as well. Black Dance is a self-determined First Nations-led industry development and producing organisation. We are proud to have a Black Dance Cultural Council with local elders and senior dance practitioners, which ensure First Nations cultural knowledge is a part of our everyday business at Black Dance. We are still maturing as an organisation and we're deeply grateful for the generosity of our sector, our board, our cultural council, who all hold space for us as we grow. We work predominantly with the independent dance artists emerging small to medium companies and their communities. 
We connect artists to industry decision makers, program directors and potential collaborators. We work hard to facilitate self-determination across the creation, distribution and presentation of First Nations dance. And similar to Ilbidgeri, we also have a producer development program that has supported Hannah Scanlon, Emily Wells and jo Joella Wakil. And I want to acknowledge their extraordinary growth and commitment to our sector. They are the next generation of leaders in Brisbane. If anyone listening today needs help with grants, our producers are here to help and please contact us. You can get connected to us through the Black Dance website. Next slide, please. At the beginning of COVID-19, Black Dance spearheaded a meeting with the other self-determined performing arts organisations, Ilbidri, Mugulan and Yuriyakin, and together we understood, understood a set of priorities which we've been advocating for at every level of government. Our first priority was ensuring our elders' safety to prevent loss of cultural knowledge. We all know our elders are the source of our culture and our stories. Without them, we have no future performing arts sector. Our second priority was figuring out ways to, that we can ensure our spiritual well-being and mental health during isolation. And of overwhelming concern is that the majority of First Nations artists are independent soul traders and their access to settling is complex. We have since heard these priorities articulated every week on the First Nations Roundtable here at the Australia Council by various speakers in different ways. Since COVID-19, Black Dance has held over 122 consultations via teleconference or online gatherings. This continues to inform the way that we redesign our own programs and how we campaign more broadly across the sector for recovery. Outside of our First Nations sector, every week, we also meet with government, the Australia Council and the 17 peak bodies across our great Southland. We have learned a lot from them and we are grateful for the alliances that we've built. For example, LPA, TNA and NAVA have all positioned the safety of our First Nations elders as a national priority and continue to support our call that the industry approach to recovery for First Nations arts and culture must be self-determined. Next slide, please. Locally at Black Dance, we run a fortnightly online gathering called Wurupi Dago which is for local Mianjin cultural art sector. One of the Brisbane traditional owners, Ani Kerry Charlton, named this gathering in Yagara language. Wirupidago means come back together again whole. We employ elders to open and close all of our online gatherings, which really grounds our conversations and enables the intergenerational transference of, no of knowledge during so social isolation. Every fortnight, we run an independent dance makers online gathering via Zoom, and we hold a regular catch up with the self-determined performing arts organizations. What we are hearing is that artists and companies alike are appreciating this time and space to reflect, contemplate, and embrace the fullness of our cultural practices. Today, on the fortnightly independent Zoom, I asked a bunch of artists what they want in the future. What does recovery mean? And here are some of the responses. Artists have genuine questions about if they want to continue in the sector. What opportunity do they have to grow if established, and established artists and companies can't survive, given the decimation of our small to medium arts and cultural sector in the last four year funding announcement? Optimism is low and artists are feeling the grind with never, never ending funding applications in a decreasing funding environment. Artists are overwhelmingly feeling that they do not want to go back to normal. And why would they when they don't have multi-year company funding or presentation and touring options? Artists also noted the decline of monolithic cultural venues 
those that define the value of art and culture by ticket sales alone. They called for a shift in the criteria for both having to make work and be expected to present in those circumstances. Artists identified that we're all too reliant on gov government funding models and hierarchical relationships to survive and grow. They questioned how did we become reliant on this infrastructure and what happens when it falls through, like now? Jacob Boehm stated, we need to redefine our practice, its relevancy to our people and broader society. Build local economies where we value communities as primary stakeholders, which means we need to speak and be accountable to these communities. Our practice needs to be in service to them, not the other way around. In the, wor in the words of our elder in residence today, Bob Wetherill, we want Aboriginal control of Aboriginal affairs. We want an independent arts and cultural sector. Next slide, please. Understanding how the mainstream peak bodies are working directly with government on developing stimulus packages for the arts has been truly profound. We understand that there is no First Nations person on the COVID-19 Emergency Response Committee to government. And we wanna know why. How can we be on the front foot without representation? We're all aware that the government response to COVID-19 has now shifted into the language of recovery. We're calling on you to feed into the notion of recovery. And we ask you all to consider what does this mean on our terms? For us at Black Dance, recovery is better positioned as re-future. This invokes the standpoint of needing to build and embed our sectors as a part of the recovery phase. We don't want things to remain the same. We want to shift the status quo. Black Dance wants to see a long overdue cohort of Indigenous small to medium dance companies established. And our sector want First Nations independence across our entire industry and ecology. We want our own venues and touring circuits. And more broadly, where is the First Nations peak body for theatre and music? Sometimes being part of these conversations has provoked more questions than answers. For example, how can we at Black Dance lobby effectively for recovery if we don't have baseline data on independent artists' earnings and income? Where do we focus our energy if we don't understand how independent artists survive on a day-to-day -day basis? Do we focus on the presenting sector and their already limited allocation of First Nations and diversity funding? From listening to our friends at PAC Australia, the already minimal budget allocated by programmers to, pre to present First Nations work will diminish in 2020 and 2021 as a result of COVID-19. Marginalised communities work falling off the radar is not only a national issue, in an ISPA meetup with global arts practitioners and administrators, we heard the same sentiment articulated just two days ago from cultural practitioners in the US and Southeast Asia. As such, we are calling for reinvestment of existing funds or new funds to resource research and development for independent artists in 2021 so they can deep dive into their cultural practice and develop their process protocols and form to the next level. We call for First Nations led online marketplaces to sell and exchange ideas about work for 2022 programming and beyond. We want a bucket of playing Australia money made available for First Nations curators. So they are resourced to program our work in 2021 and beyond. And we call for a First Nations industry and community roundtable to, to devise a 10 year plan for our re-future. We wanna work with you to form a coalition that can generate dialogue, ideas and exchange that leads to First Nations independence. We urgently need a national 
First Nations cultural arts peak body to advocate and lobby effectively on such issues as protocols, policy, stimulus packages, development of baseline data and accountability to Indigenous human rights. Now, more than ever, all roads lead to Nyaka. We need a national cultural arts peak body. Over to you, Wesley. Wow, Marinda, thank you so much. I, ho hopefully that text, even if you send it through to us, I think we can put that text up onto um, the website too so people can read. There were so many big ideas. The one that grabbed me so clearly was this idea of refuture, the idea of looking at the past but the, the future as well, not to go back to the past but to imagine what this future is on our terms, a self-determined future. Really brilliant ideas. And this idea too that Black Dance, if not the other companies, uh, Yuri Arkin and Obidri as well, talking about this kind of ecology, this how we all work together. It's not like the majors and the small to medium. It's actually how we all work together that's important. Is that some of your thinking as well for Black Dance? Yeah, and um, Wesley, um, you know, the opportunity to work um, with the other peak bodies in such a um, condensed way during COVID has really, um, for me personally, personally, as it, it's it's helped me to see how they work um, at a really strategic level and um, the knowledge that they're gearing up to have, um, an, you know, to form an arts and cultural coalition and build a ten-year strategic plan, really. Um, drives me to go, okay, you know, those other peak bodies are primed and ready for um, a self-determined approach. Mm. Um, they're relying on all of us across all of the sector to self-determine that. And so, you know, I'm, I'm constantly going, okay, how are we developing the priorities and the needs and the aspirations that we want to put into their conversation, but also that we want in our parallel self-determined conversation. Amazing. We're going to, um, just to give everyone a warning that we're gonna turn on the, the camera so we'll all be able to see each other's faces for a little bit. Um, uh, this idea of uh, th this, this notion of self-determining our future, Eva Grace, I mean, that seems very consistent with what you were talking about there, controlling it both in a cultural sense, but also how we're moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. And, and being able to imagine and being able to dream of what we've been asking for for a long time. You know, we, none of these things are really new. We've been asking for this for over 20 years. Uh, the, the development what's, of people what's and... What's stopping us from What's stopping so, us from achieving that? Um, uh, the rest of the sector being too comfortable. Mm. And they're not comfortable anymore. So now's the time for us to act. I'm going to go to Rachel Mazza. So, Rachel, you'll have to unmute when you talk here, but just this notion of what um, what do you think is stopping this self-determination uh, from being achieved? Because we've been saying it for years. Resources. It is until until we have a shared understand, uh, appreciation of the of this as a priority from those who hold the purse strings um, that we're going to continue to get this trickle effect. Of funding, um, and I just wanted to um, uh, make uh, put focus on some of the initiatives where we've seen some great results, and it it points to one one fact: it's it's sustainable, sustained rather um, uh, significant investment, um, and strategic sorry strategic significant ongoing investment um, and we saw, saw that with the work the investment that was done over many years significant funding that was put into the film sector and the, and the incredible results and body of filmmakers that we're seeing out there and the other example that i put on that list is um, the work that Australia Council did and in fact Marinda you were in there with the um, emerging producers initiative so yes we've still got a long way to go but their producers uh, who are out there running companies, Ali, um, you know, uh, went through that program. So I want to see more strategic, significant investment in our sector. Um, Rachel, yeah. And Rachel, you know, sorry, Wesley, just to step in there. You know, that's what I see. We've seen a cohort of amazing filmmakers come out. 
that was 20 years ago that investment when so what we're yeah. yeah exactly so we just see this sort of exactly what you say triple of trickle down effect we can't afford to wait 10 20 years for that type of investment and to grow that sort of arts leadership and skilled people in our sector now we haven't got enough people coming through not only the film sector we have no indigenous producers or very limited who are absolutely strapped they've you know and good on them but basically you know there's none of those that exist in south australia um so we really need to get into um you know what's happening in the back room of the art sector we heard earlier about, you know, set designers and, you know, Eva Grace, you were talking about that. We need the set designers and, you know, the cost, you know, all of that sort of stuff working in the background as well, lighting designers. So when is it next that this is going to occur? Mm. Because one of the things that has been fed back to me is where's the next generation coming through? And is that a part of the reimagine the future is going where are the next cohort of creatives coming through mm. and and when they do come through there leanne what i'm hearing from marinda there is to say you know that they need the opportunities when they're coming through or they'll just wither on the vine a little bit that notion of sustained investment strategic investment and the idea too that um you know let's say uh, yuri yakin's not much uh, younger but both our yuri yakin and dilbidri around the 30 year mark you end up going, some of our, our, our non-Indigenous counterparts, we're talking about 100-year-old companies and 80-year-old companies and the sense of saying, well, they've got that head start in many ways because they got the investment long-term early. We need that now and it's, it's a very interesting time. Marinda, just want to get some final words from you before we go back to the, to the slide presentation. Um, just this notion of the re-future just what are three things you think that need to happen right now, right in the next month for us to have a future, have a, a sense of controlling the future? Um, in, in, from a dance perspective, Wesley, or more broadly? No, dance perspective is great, just in your mind. Um, uh, a, uh, an industry and community combined you know, maybe like a week-long online gathering. I know that would be hard work, but, um, you know, these things, um, you know, we were in a Zoom this morning that was only supposed to go for an hour and we had an elder who um, needed to share with us um, lots of background information and so we had to go for two hours and we could have gone all day. And he kept saying, we just need to talk. We need to talk and we need to talk and we need to talk. And he said, maybe I've got this wrong and someone else can come forward and say, no, no, it's like this. Um, or, you know, he said, or maybe it's because he was referencing um, when he was growing up and he said um, elders like Pat Dodson used to um, train them up and test them and say, well, what are you going to do if this situation arises? And they'd be faced with all these different scenarios and they had to figure out what legislation and what policy and what media release they would write to respond. And, and you know, just this, um, uh, you know, the I guess the key message from this elder was this opportunity to gather and talk is what's missing in his perspective. And so, you know, I guess the, that's the number one thing, Wesley, um, the second thing I would say is that we need um, direct lines to all of our Indigenous MPs um, and, you know, we need a monthly roundtable with them directly where we can feed up what we're hearing from our First Nations cultural arts sector um, and so that they can push that forward, um, you know, as a, as a number one priority on the agenda. Um, and the other thing that I think we need to do, um, I think you asked for three things. Um, I, think, I think that um, artists uh, and companies alike need um, significant resourcing in this pause to do R&D. Yeah, absolutely. I think the research and development 
um, the investment in that time out to think. We, the, the next part of what we normally talk about here is what we can do collectively. And I think, Marinda, you've, you've said that too. You've said, how do we gather and talk together? How do we then make sure that that voice is heard through, in this case, the policy makers and decision makers, be they politicians or otherwise, there's others there, um, and that we need to kind of keep that focus on keep making our work as well. There's a question that's come through from, from Michael Kalbung, who's saying, uh, and unfortunately the business modeling that can sustain the indigenous arts sector that is ultimately independent of government funding is where we should be heading, thinking and strategizing. The ebb and flow of government funding and the goodwill is worrying that we keep relying on the government funds. I think a number of conversations there saying, if the government isn't gonna give it to us, what does it mean for them, for non-indigenous people to pay the rent? And what does it look like in an arts and cultural levy? What does it mean to be supporting? Um, I know there's conversations in Kwandamuka country to say, should Kwandamuka people actually be getting part of the land tax, part of the rates that are that are being put forward so that we can then help have a funding in that way? And interestingly, like the BBC has their, um, their TV licenses and that's what helps fund the BBC. Is there an independent source that we can go through and have a look at. Thank you for that question, Michael. Um, the, you know, thank you so much. Isn't it, Leanne, isn't it amazing when we hear such incredible speakers, such powerful, powerful people? You know, yes, they're women. Yes, they're black. Yes, they're powerful. Yes, they're everything. It's amazing. We're going to go back. Certainly to, are. We're going to go back to the powerful <laughs> presentation now. We've had three powerful women uh, and four of you, with Leanne. And I want to be a woman too. So what we just call it's for, it's all of us being powerful. Um, we we'll go back and have a look at the PowerPoint presentation as we look at some of the resources that we have to talk about as well. Mm -hmm. um, Leanne, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you, Wesley. Look, I know I just want to take this opportunity. Marinda, Rachel, Eva Grace, absolutely inspirational. I mean, you guys always rock it when you talk. You know your stuff. You've been around for a long time and, um, you know, you're absolutely um, brilliant colleagues and um, I'm very grateful that um, to share the industry with you guys. Um, okay, so what have we got? We've, we've, now let's talk um, resources. So we've looked, there's a number of resources available um, and I'm going to get um, Marinda, I think I'm going to get you to come in into this uh, to talk about uh, the Theatre Network Australia, but we've got um, Lottery West have COVID grants in Western Australia. We've got Playwriting Australia um, and uh, they've got Ignition um, as a focus there. Um, City Meyer Fund have a uh, thousand dollars uh, support to artists. I don't know if now Marinda is the time for you to come in and do you want to address those next two resources? Um, yeah, thanks, Leanne. So the Sydney Meyer Fund and the Theatre Network Fund are both $1,000 grants and they're super easy um, applications. The Sydney Meyer Fund, is it, it's a really quick turnaround. It opened yesterday and it closes on Sunday. Um, but you literally just put your name and your um, email address and what you do um, and, and you're done. Um, and in, if you get both of those, there's $2,000. There's two weeks worth of R&D. Um, Black Dance is happy to help anyone with an application. Ilbidgery and Black Dance are champion companies for the Theatre Network um, Cash for Crisis. And so, you know, reach out to us if you need support apply, applying. Um, but we do, we do happen to know that um, there's only one, or a few days ago, there was only one First Nations TNA um, funding application. And so we really want to see, uh, obviously really want to see our mob access these um, crisis opportunities. Thank you, Marinda. And, and look, I'll just reiterate that as well. If And um, outside of our organisations too, and thank you, Rachel and Marinda and Eva Grace, that, you know, if you're an individual person who is skilled at writing grants, you know, also put yourself out there. You know, you might want to assist, um, you know, our the talent in our pool to be able to access some of these resources as well. It's interesting, just to add to that, I think I said it earlier, NAVA, the National Association for Visual Arts, 
also has an artist benevolent fund. I see Esther. Thank you, Esther, has put the link into the chat box there. That's um, that's up up to two thousand dollars for visual artists. There's a few criteria there to have a look, and they're they're distributing money there. They have um, over two hundred thousand dollars worth of cash to to put out there in in the visual arts area. So get in there. I also see Serena uh, Sharina uh, Clanton putting up there for uh, Creative Victoria funds. There's lots of different things out there to get hold of to have a look at. We might move on to the next slide in this last five minutes that we've got. Uh, just this this sense too of uh, what um, what the links are, especially for many of us who might need support for mental health uh, to keep ourselves buoyant. If you need those resources, and also some resources in Indigenous languages, first. First Nations mobs there that uh, languages that you might be able to uh, tap into and have a little look at. Next slide, please, Michelle. Uh, and we've talked often about the resources that are on the Australia Council website, the recordings of these webinars, as well as a number of different links, uh, and especially the COVID-19 information that uh, you can access. Remembering that each jurisdiction, each state and territory will have very different rules being applied at times. So there's no universal thing. If you hear something, just test it out, look at it and see what's, because Queensland is very different to New South Wales, very different to WA, very different to Tasmania at the moment, et cetera. So have a little look and see that that's there as we're coming to the end. Uh, next slide, thanks. If you want to just talk us through this, Leanne, about um, some of the support the Australia Council's doing. Sure. Um, as, as probably most of you would already know now, the Council's got a response package called um, the Resilience Fund. Um, so, look, just in terms around, I won't go through all of it, but, um, look, there is a website there. Uh, there is support uh, in three different areas uh, around our uh, response packages. Um, if you want to find out more, Survive, thanks, Michelle. We've got the um, Survive, Adapt and Create for both individuals, groups and organisations in each of those categories. Uh, if you... Uh, now, just please also noting that the closing date for these is the 28th of May um, at the end of the month. So you still have some time, but... I would absolutely encourage you to call uh, the grants officers at Australia Council. They are there ready to have a conversation with you uh, to talk through uh, the application process. They want to make sure that you have the best opportunity to secure some funding. And just uh, saying that sometimes uh, in the in the chat there, they're talking about it's a minimum of three weeks turnaround on some of the other grants that we've been talking about. Uh, you can access all this information on the Australia Council website. Onto the next slide, please, Michelle. Uh, just saying next week, we're going to have uh, Kylie Belling, the Senior Manager of First Peoples at Creative Victoria, Peter White, who's the Senior Manager of Aboriginal Strategy Engagement at Create New South Wales, and Brenda Gifford, who's the Aboriginal Social Islander Arts Officer at, at Arts ACT. So very much talking about some of the policy uh, frameworks and things that are coming through from Victoria, New South Wales, and the ACT. And some, some great connections there to look at for next, um, next week. Oh, goodness, so much to do and such, I feel so full, isn't it? I mean, we're going to come back to our faces now. So just in case, um, when we started this today, Rachel Mazza said, will people be able to see me if I pick my nose? And I said, well, only if you want to, only if you want to. Um, but this fantastic sense of face to face, isn't it great to see such smiling, energetic, powerful people as we come together through this terrible kind of COVID-19 moment. And Leanne, I just want to say, you know, we're talking about social distancing, we're talking about physical distancing uh, and virtual so uh, sovereignty and all of these things. And just to say, in just before we started today, the Prime Minister came out and outlined three steps that we're about to go through in the next, let's call it, well, who knows, let's call it the next few months. Check it out, everyone. Check out what those steps are because they are talking about focusing on family and friends in the first step. How do we actually get closer together as people? And I think that that's a really important thing, Leanne, you know, as you... Mm. As you oh, know, absolutely. And in saying that too, Wesley, as we sort of wind up the round table is, you know, I'd really like people to sort of go away and think about, you know, how does the arts get ready for that? Is there, you know, is there a way that, you know, as, as like cinemas are doing, are thinking about seating arrangements and seating plans to be able to get that up and happening? Can that happen in our theatre sector? Mm -hmm. How can we be a part 
of um, opening the doors again. Well, maybe even also saying, what does it mean to be outdoors? What does it mean when we can gather more outdoors? Do we change our, 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 the ways that we're working? Just talking about indoors, just a, a little last little plug that on the 27th of May, the Australia Council will reveal the First Nations Arts Awards, including the Red Ochre Lifetime Achievement Award for a male and a female, the Dreaming Award, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Arts Fellowships. Uh, this year, the award ceremony will be broadcast live streamed uh, between 6 and 7 uh, p.m. on the 27th of May, and there'll be a live performance by the Stiff Gyms, and it's an important opportunity to connect and really celebrate what we've been doing. Uh, we've run slightly over time, can I just join Leanne and I to say thank you so much for you amazing speakers. I feel absolutely chock-a-block up to Pussy's Bow with love and energy and power and a sense of what my re-future will be. Thank you everyone for joining us. How amazing to have so many of us, over a hundred of us joining in week by week. Leanne, take us out to say, to, to end us off today. I'm not going to sing Wesley, but I just want to... <laughs> <laughs> redirect everyone look thank you for joining us it's always a, such a privilege to see all of the names come up and all of our guests joining us um and um, rachel eva grace marinda wesley the whole osco team sitting behind us thank you and have a fabulous weekend wash your hands stay safe love, yes. you. love you love you love you bye-bye bye-bye all